Um, hey, guys. Uh, uh, where's Don? Is Don here? Or did Don leave? I think, I, yeah, he had to leave. I, saw, I caught him in the, uh, in, the, in the hallway there earlier, and he's like, man, I got to tell you, it's been really good with you guys doing worship. Usually when the worship leader starts talking, I just go, oh, man, shut that guy up. <laughs> um, but, but you had some good things to say, and I really appreciate it. I was like, thanks, man. Um, and I actually want to say thanks so much for disagreeing with me um, because I think a lot of us don't learn a lot in church because we're too Greek. Now, let me explain what that means. Um, back in, like, Greek culture, when an orator would get up in the time of the philosophers, they get up and they would just give their speech and their philosophy. And the people would sit in the amphitheaters and they would listen attentively. And then based on whether they agreed with him or not, they would put money in an offering plate at the end of the philosophy session. And then everyone would go home. Um, juxtapose that with the way Jesus taught, with the way rabbis taught. Rabbis actually, we give the disciples kind of a bad rep. We're always like, dude, those guys never understood anything. They're always like, what, Jesus? What do you mean? I don't understand. But what you don't know, if you haven't studied some um, Hebrew culture, is that that is the way rabbis and their students were taught to interact. The rabbi would ask a question, and then you weren't allowed to respond to the rabbi. You had to pose a question back to the rabbi. And I love that because I think questions often sh teach us more than just telling you facts. Um, and so I, I'm up here today to say, what if we've been asking the wrong question? Um, I actually, I got a gift for you guys. Uh, um, there's a whole pile of books. I actually wrote a book um, full of things that you can agree or disagree with. And, uh, and the title of the book is called Finding God's Life for My Will. And I wrote that book because I've been doing stuff in the church for 20 years, and I've just felt like we've all been asking the wrong question. Everyone I meet, especially younger people and even older people and my age people, whatever age that is, uh, we're always like, what's God's will for my life? What's the next step? What am I supposed to do with my money? What am I supposed to do with my career? Amen? I mean, if you're not asking that, like, you're, you, uh, God bless you. Um, <laughs> But I'm like, guys, God's will for our life is really clear. Um, in Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for your life in Christ Jesus. In, in chapter 4, he says, Flee sexual immorality. This is God's will for your life. Uh, Micah 6, 8 says, um, What does the Lord require of you? Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Um, and we go, yeah, 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 yeah. I got all that. Uh, but I want to know what to do now. But let me explain why that's kind of silly. Um, the other morning, we had an early flight. We were, uh, it was like 5.30 flight. So I'm up at like 4 a.m., and I'm feeling like a king because I actually got up to my alarm. I didn't wake up my wife. Usually I wake up to my wife beating me with a pillow, like going, your alarm's going off. Can I get an amen? Any other hard sleepers? I saw Gary this morning at the breakfast, and he was like, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's me. And uh, so I get up, and uh, we have four daughters, by the way. Uh, I've talked to most of y'all. Yes, pray for me <laughs> and my lovely wife. Having four daughters is great. It just means someone's always crying, and it's, it's usually me. Uh, <laughs> But I can throw a mean Disney princess party, let, let me tell you. And I know some of you, I've already talked to some of you like, so you still, uh, you know, trying for that boy? I was like, why would I? God gives girls to a family that already has a man. <laughs> Sid liked that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I've gotten up early, right? I've gotten up early. And the only way my daughters will eat any kind of nutrition is if I mask it in a chocolate smoothie. Right? Otherwise, like chicken nuggets, french fries, I'm like, you're going to die an early death. Let me give you something that's not brown. And um, so I get these meal replacement smoothies. I've done lots of research about nutrient dense meal replacement. And uh, I give them, and I pile it in, and I throw in all kinds of extra stuff. So I'm sitting there, I've put in the, the powder, and I've, I've put in a banana, and I've, um, I've got an avocado and some spinach, and I put in the powder and coconut milk. I'm like, this, you know. Good fats, no sugar, y'all know? 
you guys are into nutrition, right? You're pro athletes, okay? And uh, and my nine year old, she has this way of creeping up on you, like something out of a horror movie, because <laughs> she's got long brown hair. And I'm sitting there, and it, she's like, our stairs come down, and then there's a little landing, and then it comes down, and I'm like doing the thing. And it's four four in the morning, right? And I'm like, uh -huh. and it's like, hi, daddy, and I. <laughs> I look over, and she's standing there like this with her hair down, and you can't even see her face. I'm like, oh, hi, oh, you know, <laughs> and uh, I'm like, hey, Isley, is that you? And she's like, yes, Daddy, and, and she goes, can I help you make the smoothie? I was like, yes, you can, because, you know, I was feeling like a boss because I'm going to make the smoothie and put it in the fridge so that when I fly off, my wife's going to have this nice nutrient-dense smoothie to, to share with the children. Again, I'm, I'm highlighting my good moments for you guys, so. And uh, so she comes down, and she's like, oh, what can I do? What can I do? I was like, oh, put some spinach in there. What I forgot, though, is while she was talking to me, I was forking out the avocado, because you do half an avocado in a smoothie makes it real creamy. It's real nice, and, you know, it's got good fats. So I'm putting the, the avocado in, and then as I'm talking to her, I drop the fork and the avocado in the Vitamix. Now, do you guys have Vitamix at home? Ours has, like, as much horsepower as a Ford Mustang, right? And... Uh, this is no, no slouch of a blender, and I put the thing in, and she comes in, and she's like, oh, let me grab some spinach. So she takes a big handful of spinach, and she puts it in and completely covers the fork. So I, I like, totally forget about it. And so we're talking. I'm like, yeah, I'm an awesome dad. I'm so great. I'm very attentive to everyone's needs. But there's a fork in the blender. She puts the top on. She's like, Dad, can I start it? Sure, baby. And I'm, like, rinsing something off. It's like the lights are going... And I was like, see, she is possessed. You know, I was like, ah. And then, and then all of a sudden, the fork <laughs> flies out the side of the blender. Okay? It flies out the side of it. And it hits the wall. It puts a hole in the wall. Do you remember? It dents the fork. I'm like, if that went this way, I would have been impaled, right? I would be dead. And, uh, and smoothie just blasts everywhere. Like, just a cosmic array of smoothie. And, um... Anyway, so I think six months later, we were still finding smoothie spots on the ceiling. And I say all this to say, a lot of us are like, what's your plan, God? What's the next step? What else can I do? What else can I accomplish? What else can I, like, do with my career? What else can I achieve? And we're throwing more and more and more stuff into the blender. Like, God, what's your plan? What's your plan? What's your plan? And he's like, there's a fork in the blender. Like, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Like, like what else can I put in there? What else? I, I got to look good. I got to do stuff. And he's like, there's a fork in the blender. Like, you want to know my plan for your life, but have you forgiven that dude? You got a fork of bitterness. You got a fork of greed. Like, you want more and more money, but what are you going to do with it once you got it? Right? Because this is my point. I don't think God really cares so much what you do with your life. I think he cares how you live your life and why you live your life. He's not really impressed if you win three Stanley Cups. He's, he takes pleasure when you love your wife as much as your career. Or I should say, in my case, I had to love her more than my career. And so if I could say anything to you guys, and I've got so much I want to say, you're like, we know you can't finish a song without talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anything I didn't get to... Uh, I meant to say, my publisher, they heard I was coming here, and my book doesn't come out till August, but they're like, can we send you a bunch of books for everybody? And so you can have a free book. You can take one to read or to burn if you don't like what I'm saying. Um, but So I don't have to cover everything, which is good. But I think the one thing I would love to leave you with is this, is that God is not after your success. He's after your surrender. And he's not after your achievements. He's after intimacy with you. And I know for guys, that's, like, a really strange thing to say. Like, intimacy? What is that? What you mean? How do you, how do you even have intimacy with God? Uh, well, before me, let me just drill home my point, okay? Three things from Scripture. Um, if you have a Bible, open up to Mark 7. Um, and this is, this is just a real quick snapshot of why I think God works on a different paradigm. Because I say things like that, and I, and I want you to know that as pro athletes and as a musician, I think we can relate on that. Is that our profession is, works on a different schematic than our relationship with God, right? 
Because if you don't perform in your profession, you get cut, you get dropped. If I don't perform in my profession, I don't get asked back. I don't sell CDs. But the way my profession works is not the way my relationship works. Amen? And some of us, if I'm honest, our capitalism has invaded our kingdom. And we think God works on that same paradigm. And he doesn't. Read, check this out. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, touched his tongue. Gross. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epphatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Um, I love what Brian was saying last night about, like, what are the strange relationships you have in your life? Because you got to understand, Jesus was already a big deal at this point. And if you go through Jesus' ministry, I, I, I love how Brian said, like, how are you inconveniencing yourself for other people? Another way to say it is, how are you embracing the ministry of interruption? Because rarely are the ministry opportunities God gives us, rarely are they on our plan, on our timeline, on our schedule. It's usually someone or some fan, maybe it's a security guard. It's usually people imposing themselves on our agenda. How do I know that? Because Jesus got imposed upon over and over and over again. There's a bleeding woman who tugs at his robe. There's a man who's lowered through the ceiling by his friends. He's constantly being interrupted, and here we have him. He's on his road, going somewhere important. Crowds are following him. He's doing his thing. And here they force a deaf and mute guy in front of him, which at that time, you got to understand, this dude was socially outcast. They believed that he was a result of some sin in him or his family, that he got what he deserved. And he was a complete nuisance, and in, in a lot of aspects, rabbis would be unclean for touching someone like this. And what does Jesus do? He embraces this moment, man. And so much so, he just gets real gross, which he touches his tongue. He spits, and he touches it, and he's like, Neh. like that. Like, why do that, Jesus? I don't, I, I don't know why he did that, because he could have just, just been like, healed. He didn't do that. Why? We see he puts his fingers in the man's ears. Jesus isn't doing this. Right? If he's putting his fingers in the man's ears, he's holding the man's face in his hands, staring into this guy whose whole life he's been told he's nothing, he's nobody. He does not have an ounce of the status that as a pro athlete you've experienced in this life. He's not even on the same playing field. And uh, he whispers, like, God, so, so, see, so just look at this. Jesus just does all the stuff he doesn't have to do. He touches the man's tongue. He puts his face in his hands, and he's whispering healing. All things that he could be like, healed, see ya. And one question is, when was the last time you let Jesus just hold your face in his hands? Like, do you have a sense in your soul that you are beloved? Like what Brian was talking about, that before Jesus did his ministry, he heard the Father's voice of approval. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well, well pleased. Are you playing out of that validation? Brian said, are you playing from validation or for it? Another way I like to say it is, are you living for God, or have you been redeemed to realize you're just living because of God? Are you still trying to, like, if I do enough ministry, then I'll be, like, awesome. I want you to know, this guy, he can't tell Jesus he's awesome. He can't even hear Jesus' teaching, but he still matters to Jesus. He's got nothing to offer him. And Jesus is like, great, I can work with that. God can work with needy. Let me just, a little caveat, you can't be too needy for Jesus. You can only be too strong. Need is the place he can fill. And I've heard a lot of pastors, like, totally butcher the Lord's prayer or totally butcher prayer, and they say, you can't come with your need until you first adore him, and then you confess, and then you give thanks. 
then you can offer your supplication. I said, have you read the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, what's that? It's your need to be reminded that you're his beloved son and daughter. Who is in heaven? Hallowed be your name. That's your need to be a part of a fame that's bigger than you. The reason people are obsessed with famous people is because they're made for the glory of God. And if they don't get a touch of his fame, they'll settle for humans. So hallowed be your name is God going, this is your need. You need to reorient yourself every morning to go, it's about your glory, not mine. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I need your kingdom. I need your will. Give us this day our daily bread. I need food. I need sustenance. Keep us far from temptation. I need your help. Let's be honest. God says, especially, you know, as Cloud was talking, he doesn't tell us to stand up against sexual immorality. He tells us to flee. It's one of the only temptations that we're told to run away from. It's interesting. Keep us far from temptation. Deliver us from it. See, the Lord's Prayer is just need, 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 need. So the next time someone tells you you can't just come with your need to God, I would say, what else do I come to him with? All those other things, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, those are all things that I need. I need to adore him. I need to confess. Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay, so you got a deaf and mute guy. Okay, I get that. Jesus loves poor people. He loves people like that. How else do I know that God wants intimacy with you? Because the best disciple, all he wanted was intimacy with Jesus. What do I mean? How many of you guys were taught growing up that John was Jesus' best friend? The disciple John. Anybody? I remember, I grew up in the church, so I remember, do you guys remember felt boards? Do you remember those? Do you get, some of the young guys are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, they used to have this magical board, and you'd take these paper, cut out people, and you'd slap them up, and be like, oh, Jesus walked on the water. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> um, sorry, that's my Chris Farley impression. Dad, I can't see too good. Is that Bill Shakespeare over there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jesus gets out of the boat, and he's walking on the water. Uh, sorry. Um, I digress. <laughs> anyway, so you could do all that with a felt board. And I remember my Sunday school teacher, she's like, here are the 12 disciples. Here's Thomas. He doubted. Here's Peter. He sank. And here's John. John was Jesus' best friend. I'm like, I want I want to be Jesus' best friend. Mm-mm. John. John was the disciple Jesus loved. I said, I want I want to be the disciple Jesus loves. Like, Mm-mm. John. And it, it kind of bothered me. Because I was like, I thought God didn't show favoritism. Like, oh no, no. John was his best friend. Because he, he spoke to the crowds. Then he spoke to the 12, they just had the three, and they just had the one. But then I read the Bible, and I realized the only place that John is called the disciple that Jesus loves is in the book that he wrote. <laughs> but listen, that actually, that actually is astounding. It's not a pride thing. It's actually the most humble thing he could have said about himself. Because this was the best disciple on paper, on a stat sheet. He was the dude. I mean, he was the only one who was at the cross. He was the only one who got custody of Jesus' mother. He's the only one who laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. So on paper, he's the guy. And if he's like us, he's going, and John, the disciple who laid his head on Jesus' chest, and John, you know, the one that didn't punk out and run away like all the other ones. And John, the three-time Stanley Cup winner. And Mike, the four-time Dove Award winning blah, 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 blah. John undermines achievement identity. And he says, when he decides to describe himself, he said, nah, I'm none of those things. I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Which means you can be Jesus' best friend. You can be Jesus' best friend. And so many of us, man, just listening to Cloud last night, I was like, oh, I want you to believe it for yourself, man. You know? Come on. 
I should believe that. And you guys, how powerful are you on the ice if the, the score doesn't dictate how beloved you are? Let me give you one last example, okay? Because I will talk forever. So I'm forcing myself to keep. Is there anything else I was saying I was going to say that I haven't said? You're tearing up. <laughs> uh, again, raise your, if you got anything you want to say in response to me or disagree with, I welcome it with open arms. Um, last thing. This is fun. This is really fun. Um, how many, I started with this. How many of you guys have, like, studied Hebrew culture at all? Or should I say culture at the time of Jesus? There's this really awesome guy you guys are raising here. You guys know Ray, Ray Vanderlaan? You know who that is? He's this dude. We got to meet him one time. Um, we were out on tour with Lecrae. You guys know Lecrae? He's a hip-hop artist. And uh, it was so funny. Lecrae comes in our, in our dressing room one day on this tour. He's like, yo, I got these instructional videos from this guy, Ray Vanderlaan, from the 80s. You guys need to come and watch these. And we come, and Ray Vanderlaan, God bless him, he is the whitest, nerdiest dude on the planet. But he's unpacking all this, like, he's in Israel. He leads all these trips to Israel. And he helps Easterners see the Bible through the, or he helps Westerners see the Bible through the Eastern lens. Real quick example, if I say to you, God is, fill in the blank. Give me a word. God is almighty. God is love. God is forgiving. God is worthy. God is holy. You guys are so Western. Because if I asked a bunch of Easterners that, I'd say God is a fortress. God is eagle's wings. God is honey on my tongue. See, we think in abstract. They think in concrete. And that's why when Brian was talking about every New Testament reality has an Old Testament picture, Y'all don't know how far this goes. So when I stand here and I say, I believe that God is after intimacy with you before he's after success from you, I got quite an example. How many of you guys have taken Last Supper before? Uh, Eucharist, communion, grape juice, cracker, wine, and some, some uh, denominations. Um, so Jesus is chilling uh, up with the disciples in the upper room. And they're celebrating the Last Supper, which you guys know what the Last Supper was. Israelites were celebrating their, um, exi their exile from Egypt, their freedom from the Egyptians, and how God parted the Red Sea. And so they celebrated, and, uh, you know, they had to kill the, the Passover lamb and paint the blood over the doorways. And, and Jesus said, I want you to celebrate this. Well, scholars say there were seven cups of wine in this Passover feast that they were celebrating. And most scholars say when Jesus gets to the third cup, this was the cup of salvation. And traditionally at that time, when the rabbi got to the third cup, nobody drank from it. It was set aside. And he said, we don't drink from this one because that's just for the Messiah. So y'all don't read this as, you know, in 2019, reading it as hockey players and wives and athletes and musicians. We don't see what's happening. But when Jesus just takes that cup and drinks of it, all the disciples go, ooh shoot because the disciples thought that Jesus was going to release them from Roman occupation they had an idea of what following Jesus would get them they didn't realize that following Jesus means they just get him now some of us follow Jesus the same way right I'll follow you but now you owe me x y and z a good way to figure out where your idols are just ask yourself, what is Jesus not giving you that's ticking you off? Or what has Jesus taken away that's made you hate him? And remind you, idols are often really good things. Okay? Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, third cup. So he takes it, and they're like, ooh, he going to set us free from Rome. Ooh, yeah. We're going to conquer some Romans, man. Let's go. You know, and the zealot, he's over there. He's like, yeah, let me kill some Romans. Let's go. You know, Peter's like chopping people's, you know, ears off. You know, that they, they thought this was going to be a violent insurrection of human power. But then Jesus says something totally weird. He goes, this is my covenant with you. Take and drink it, all of you. We don't hear this. 
Do you know what Jesus just said in that time, in that culture? He said, will you marry me? All the disciples went, whoa. You do it, Peter. You're always jumping into things. Let me, let me just, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run through this real quick. So in that time, in that culture, when a Hebrew boy wanted to marry a Hebrew girl, he came to his dad. And he said, hey, dad, uh, found this girl I want to make little rabbis with. And uh, his dad's like, okay, okay, cool. Um, let's go to her dad. And they would go to her dad, and he would say, how much you want for your daughter? And he could sit there like, mm, let me see, like 42 camels and uh, seven shekels. And he kind of sounds like uh, Otto from Star Wars. Do you remember that? <laughs> 42 pod racers and the king. Um, and uh, anyway, they would debate. And here, and girls before you're like, oh, that is so sexist. I hate that. Um, it was actually pretty cool in that culture. The, the groom would actually pay for the opportunity to propose. So he would have to pay the bride price, and then she could say no. So her dad could be like, okay, uh, it's going to be like 50 camels, say no, say no, you know. Um, so he'd pay the bride price, right, and then they'd put him in a room with her, and they'd get all their relatives in the room, and they'd pour a glass of wine. And he'd take the wine, and he would drink from it, and then he would slide it across the table, and he'd say, this is my covenant with you, take and drink it. At which point, there's like a moment of just <sighs> bated breath. Everyone's like, is she going to do it? Is she going to do it? And if she, she could be like, no, you smell like hummus. I don't want to, you know. Or she could take it, and she could drink it. And she didn't say a word. All she did was drink it. And if she drank it, that was her way of saying, I do. At which point, she would go back to her village or her town, and he would go back to his village or his town. And they wouldn't see each other for the whole engagement time. Usually the engagement time was like six months to a year. Okay? What was he doing? What was she doing? Well, this is weird. People wouldn't call her by her name during the engagement period. She was renamed one who was bought with a price. That's how she was referred to. She didn't know the day, the time, or the hour of the wedding. She had to wait for him to come unannounced. And that day they would have the wedding. What's he doing? He's over at his dad's house. Some of you don't know this. Has, has anyone been to Israel? I've actually never been to Israel. My wife's been to Israel. Um, but family dwellings back then were way different. They are called insulas. And the way it worked was some, you know, generations before, they built a house. And then the next generation, the son who married the daughter, he would build a mansion. You guys are like, ooh, a mansion. Calm down. The mansion was just an apartment off his parents' house. Now your girl's like, I'm so glad I didn't marry a Jewish boy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, and they would, generation after generation, they would build another apartment, another mansion, another mansion, another mansion, until it was one long sort of like sweeping insula, right? So he would go back to his dad's house, and he'd be building an insula or a mansion onto the insula. He didn't get to decide when it was finished. He just had to build, build, build. Hey, Dad, is it ready? No? Okay, build, build, build. Is it ready? Build, build, build. Is it ready? And his dad would sit there and be like, mm, no, it needs like a little paint there. It needs like. And then when the dad finally decided it was, it was good, he would come to his son and go, it's time. Boy, like, okay. And he'd get his groomsmen, and they would ride into her town unannounced, and they would blow shofars coming into town. <laughs> I like interactive things. Let's all make a weird ram noise. Here we go. That's so awkward. You guys sound like dying sheep. Like, um, anyway, so they come in. She's like, oh, my goodness. She run down the stairs, down the aisle. They get married, make little rabbis, live happily ever after, okay? Does this sound like anything to you? Rewind the tape. Jesus sitting at the Last Supper. This is my covenant with you. Take and drink it. Okay, cool. Boom. Okay, guys. Oh, I forgot to mention this part. The only way the guy and the girl could communicate while they were engaged was the best man. The best man would take messages from him and run to her town and come back. So, like, he'd come up, hey, do you like me? Yes, no, or maybe. Okay, and he'd come back. This is what she says. So, Jesus says, this is my covenant. They take it, they drink it. He goes, hey, check it out. You guys are my bride. Your name has changed. You're now one who's bought with a price. Um, there's going to be a long engagement time. But don't sweat it. I'm going to send my best man, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to communicate between us. Okay? Now, you don't know the day, the time, or the hour. You know, the son actually doesn't know the day, the time, or the hour. Only the dad, my father does. Um, but I'm going to my father's house to prepare 
a room for you where there are many mansions. That's what I'm going to be doing. So meanwhile, you keep watch because you don't know when I'm coming. But one day, my father's going to give me the green light, and I'm going to come with my groomsmen, the holy angels. And they're going to blow their shofars, the four trumpets. And I'm going to bring you home for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come on. Come on. Come on. Um. And people still want to insist this is religion, this is morality. And and I just want to say to you guys, um, and maybe practically you're like, well, what do you mean, Mike? Like, what is intimacy with Christ look like? Because honestly, that just makes me feel awkward. Like, I ain't nobody's bride. You know, it's an analogy, you know. Um, And I'll just say for me, um, it looked like this. Every morning I would wake up and I'd try to pray, and I was terrible at it. And I would just wake up with my head on the pillow and, like, drool all over. And I'd be like, oh, that was a great prayer session. Um, And I actually love what Cloud said about his father. Did you hear him? How he's like, my father would fall asleep in church. And my first initial thing was to, like, be judgmental of his father. And he's like, God bless my dad. He worked so hard. And he just didn't have anything left. And so I want to say to you, if you keep falling asleep praying, what better place to fall asleep than with your head on your father's lap? You know, so don't beat yourself up too bad. But figure out something that works for you. For me, you know what I just started doing? I was like, I had this field behind my house that I lived in. I just get up. I just start walking. And I just start talking like a crazy person to heaven. I'd be like, hey, God. What's up? I'd be like, I'd open up my Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Dang it. <sighs> I want a lot of stuff, God. Um, so help me with that. But then I'd read a couple more scriptures. And that is what radically shifted. Did you hear Brian say, uh, maybe it was in our core group, but he said um, a couple years ago, God just said, I need you to spend this much time with me. And um, maybe I could encourage you with this, and I'll leave you with this. Um, Maybe don't even think of your devotional time as spending time with God. Because remember how I was saying capitalism has kind of invaded a lot of our kingdom mindset? Like, if I do this, then I get this. If you pray, you don't necessarily get answered prayer. You get Jesus, who is the answer to your prayers, whether you realize it or not. If you spend time with God, you don't necessarily get a better career or more goals. Prince left, but we were laughing about that. He's like, if I spend time with prayer, God's going to give me interceptions? Okay, great, yeah. And he goes, I know, he said, I know it doesn't work like this, but, and the thing is, hang on, what was I going to say? Hmm. I got I to gotta end it. And now I'm like, what is the last thing I should say? Because it needs to be, like, so good. Um, but I'll say this. Maybe stop saying I'm going to spend time with God and maybe start saying I'm going to waste time with God. Because for achievement-driven people, that's what it feels like. That's what the disciples said of this harlot who pours out perfume on Jesus' feet. They said, how wasteful that you would do that. And I'll, and I'll end with this. Troy shared with me yesterday we are talking in the lobby. He was talking about Billy Graham. Y'all heard of Billy Graham? He he was the dude, right? He was asked in his last years, what's your greatest regret, right, Troy? And he said, my greatest regret is I would have done 50% less speaking gigs. How dare you say that, Billy Graham? You know how many people wouldn't have gotten saved if you did 50% less speaking gigs? Billy Graham goes, no, same amount. I'm not the one saving them. God doesn't need me. He wants me. He said, I wish I had 50% more time sitting at Jesus' feet. That's what Jesus says to Mary and Martha. Our culture says, Martha, 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 achieve, 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 achieve. Jesus said, Mary's chosen what is necessary. And let me just wrap up with this. Can I, can I be honest? Like, three years ago, when I felt like Jesus said, you need to cut the number of shows you're doing in half, I was devastated. Because I knew he was calling me to it. And a lot of us hide behind this thing when we know God is calling us to less. Is we go, how am I going to provide? And we, we throw this fear thing in there. 
Like, and we justify it because we're living by our fear. By the way, the most repeated command in the Bible, do you guys know what it is? Do not be afraid. 365 times in Scripture. Mm. And, and it isn't that we're really afraid God's, gonna, God's not going to provide. We're afraid that he would call us to a position of less power that we would provide with. I love that analogy Brian gave of sitting in first class. He gives you first class so you can give it to someone else. 